I'm going to do an introduction to the contamination control network and explain a little bit about the background while we're just waiting for our session to start. CCN is a members not-for-profit society or association. It has been established to provide news, knowledge, training, education, and a communication network collaboration between interested parties in the field of contamination control. Its spheres of interest include specification, design, control, testing, and monitoring of clean rooms and clean air devices, instruments associated with all these activities, particularly the measurement, the classification, and testing. The applications include clean rooms, clean air devices, containment systems, operating theatres, isolation rooms, isolators, restricted access barriers. And it also considers clean room garments and consumables. The membership is available to individual students and corporate. Some of the current resources available to members include a membership copy of the Clean Air and Containment Review magazine and recent published guidance by CCN includes commentary on the systematic review of ISO 14644 Part 1 and Part 2, 2015, a review of air filtration standards, particularly HEPA filter standards as expressed in EN 1822 and ISO 29463. There is an explanation and guidance on the application of energy saving practice and particularly BSEN ISO 14644-16, a standard that UK experts have had a very made input into. Training forms an important part of our service to members and the industry. And there are two elements of that training. There is the CTCBI clean room testing course. And the most recent one of those was delivered in March 2021. And there is another course planned for November this year. And of course, we also have webinars such as the one that you are joining today. And here's an image from the clean room testing course. And of course, a major focus of the contamination control network is around the clean room standards. There are some 18 of these currently published and they go through systematic review and it becomes very important that you keep up to date with those standards and their uh, publication because they do change from time to time. So I'm going to start our session this afternoon and welcome you all to this Contamination Control Network webinar concerning BSEN ISO 14644 parts one and two. <clears throat> and these relate to classification and monitoring of clean rooms and associated controlled environments. And I would say these are the foundation standards of the whole family of ISO clean room standards. And in the UK, they are published as British standards. And this means that they've gone through a process of review and endorsement within the British Standards Institution and a mirror committee of UK experts. My name is Gordon Farkerson. I'm the president of the Contamination Control Network. And also I've been highly active for many years in the development of ISO clean room standards. And I'm chair of British Standard LBI 30 committee, which is responsible for UK input into the development of the standards and for the process of engrossing them as national British standards. I'm also chair of SEN Technical Committee 243. I'm head of delegation for UK 
representation in ISO Technical Committee 209. So let's begin our session. So our learning objectives today are learning how contamination control standards specify requirements for critical environmental control parameters. And today we're going to focus on the essential features of BSEN ISO 14644 part one, 2015, classification of air cleanliness. I will also link for the life science sector, how this standard, this ISO standard, ties in with GMP Annex 1 for sterile medicinal products. And we'll also move on to consider the phase after classification when we've built and started up our clean room, the monitoring to provide performance evidence of continued compliance. So the core standard, ISO 14644, part one, 2015, which is published as a BSEN standard. And the image on the top right of this screen is of the front cover of the UK's British standard version. <clears throat> Other countries will publish exactly the same document but with some national standards organization representation on the front cover. But the core technical material is always the same. The current edition, this edition was published on the 15th of December, 2015, and it focuses on classification of air cleanliness by particle number concentration in clean rooms and associated controlled environments. So this is really important. It's quite a narrow, specific focus. Classification of air cleanliness. So there's a system of classification, but it considers just total particle number concentration in the clean room or associated controlled environment. So this could apply to a human scale clean room, it could apply to an isolator or safety cabinet, and it could apply to the internal environment of a small clean air device, such as a unidirectional airflow hood. It defines the concentration of all total airborne particles. So it does not differentiate biocontamination from other particle sources. It is limited to a designated range of considered threshold particle sizes from 0.1 micron and greater to 5 micron and greater. So it's always a threshold size and numbers equal to or greater than that threshold size. The reference method of measurement is an airborne particle counter. <clears throat> and I'll mention a little bit more about that in a moment. It's a generic standard and it is not application specific. <clears throat> so the standard has been written very specifically in a totally generic way. It's not a pharma industry standard. It's not a life science standard. It's written as a flexible standard, generic in style. So I like to think of this as a toolbox full of appropriate spanners and sockets, but you need to choose the right one for your task. And today I will try and explain some of the general elements and also illustrate how we get the right spanners out of the box. So the reference method for classification and definition and designation of cleanliness is particle number concentration using an airborne particle counter. And in the language today, certainly of the ISO standard for such devices, we describe these as light scattering airborne particle counters. So you should see the initialism L SAPC being used. The particle counter 
works by scattering light. And I thank Lighthouse for the image I've used here. Other vendors are available. But we have a light source and we have a cell through which a sample of air is taken. And as particles pass through this chamber, the light is scattered. And the number of flashes defines the number of particles and the intensity of flashes relates to the size of particles. And like any instrument, there is uncertainty of measurement. It's not an absolute instrument and things can go wrong if you pass too many particles through the chamber or you try and measure particles that are too small or particles that are too large. So the standard ISO 14644 part one provides us very clear boundaries of application that relate to the type of light scattering airborne particle counter specified here. So let's look at some of the fundamental content. So class of cleanliness classification is defined by ISO class, the occupancy state and the designated particle size considered. And the standard requires that you define at least one particle size, threshold particle size equal to or greater than. And if you wish or a regulatory authority defines that you need more than one particle size, then the second one must be greater or equal to 1.5 times the diameter of the first. And this is to ensure that there is some degree of separation between selected particle sizes. The standard defines three occupancy states as built, at rest, and operational. And it's up to you to choose one or more of those occupancy states, depending on what you wish to achieve. So it may be that a regulation or your customer requires an as-built test of the clean room for classification, or might be at rest, or there might be an operational requirement, or it could be one or more of those. So you must always define the occupancy state. The standard also specifies the minimum number of sampling locations in the clean zone for classification, the air sample size required at each location, and how to evaluate the data. So you start to see that the fundamentals of the standard provide quite a lot of um, rigidity in terms of what we need to consider. But in certain areas, particularly the occupancy states, some options are available. And also we have options to choose a designated particle size. <clears throat> to suit our particular operation. Now it's very important to use correct cleanliness designation when we are quoting the standard in either a specification where we're asking for a clean room to comply with a class within the standard, or we are reporting testing carried out against this standard. So correct designation is very important. So the designation of cleanliness class requires that we define the class number. ISO classes one to nine, and I'll explain how those are defined in a moment. The occupancy state and the designated particle size or sizes. So as an example, and I've just put one example here, ISO class four, say, whatever class is relevant, at rest or in operation, 
or it could be as built, so the occupancy state. And here we have two designated particle size thresholds, 0.2 micron and 0.5 micron. So to define this class correctly, we need to say ISO class 4 at rest at 0.2 micron and 0.5 micron threshold particle sizes. So very, very often I see some lack of understanding here. So I often see specifications that say to comply with ISO 14644, completely meaningless. Which standard? Doesn't mean anything. Does it mean all 18 standards in the family? I very much doubt it. If I just put ISO 14644 part one or BSEN ISO 14644 part one without a date, it always means the latest version. If I add the date, the current one, 2015, this means it is a specific additional version of the standard. And then if I put this full string that we should use here in the UK, BSEN ISO 14644 part one 2015 is the British standard version. If I was in Germany, it would be DIN EN ISO 14644 part one 2015. And it's an identical standard. Um, the German version actually would be written in German. So correct designation is really important. And I would just say, please be careful not to get sloppy and certainly avoid this one. ISO 14644 doesn't have any meaning. Now we come to the really important part of the standard. And this is really the hinge pin of the standard. And it is the classification by table. And it's table one in the standard and it defines the nine ISO classes, and it defines these six threshold particle sizes. So it considers particles 0.1 micron, greater and equal to. So when I'm counting these, when I'm looking at these particle number concentrations, they start at this threshold and include all the particles equal to or greater than this threshold size. It's not a window between 0.1 and 0.2. It is 0.1 and greater. 0.2 equal and greater. 0.3 and so on. So that's the first important point. Classes followed by threshold particle sizes equal to and greater than. Then we have the particle number concentration. So these are the class limits in particles per cubic meter. Okay, so all the results are expressed in particles per cubic meter. As you'll see later, this doesn't mean you have to sample a cubic meter. So your sample size will be dependent on collecting sufficient sample that you get a robust measurement. More about that in a minute. So we have particle number concentrations and be very clear that there's some important things here. Where a number exists, that defines a class limit <coughs> within the standard. But where the boxes are blank, there is good reason for this. And these are values which or air regions where it would be inappropriate for various reasons to carry out classification. So it's not part of the ISO classification system. So where you see these C's, the D's and E's and the F here, they are areas where you, you do not and cannot use the standard to classify. 
So let's try and explain that a little bit more. So I've annotated this diagram. In C, the block yellow here, designated C, generally it would mean that there are too many particles. The concentration of particles would be so high that you would get error in counting due to coincidence counting error principally. So this means that the particles would drown the particle counter and you might get particles that are very close together that become counted as a single larger particle rather than an individual smaller particle. So that's why those boxes are blank. Then we have the ones marked D and this is at the other end of the spectrum. Here the particle numbers would be too few for the particle counting test to be robust and reliable. So too few particles, you would need an impractically large sample size in order to do classification. Then in the zone marked E, we also have very low numbers. So we've got low concentration and the measurement problem there. But we also have larger particles, which would lead to very significant error due to losses in the sampling tubing and in the uh, optical system. And then the final one, which is highlighted slightly differently, ISO class 5 at threshold 5 micron equal to or greater than 5 micron. And it points out there that not only do we have the particle loss problem, we also have the particle size problem, the small number of particles problem. But there's an additional clause F here, which points out that there is some special guidance given for the situation if you wanted to have an indicative particle measurement at greater or equal to five micron threshold in ISO 5. Now that will become clear in a minute, but it specifically relates to regulatory requirements in the life science sector. So very, very important. And I would absolutely recommend that you read in detail the table of notes to the classification. So the table shown here qualifies the numbers in this table. So let's move on to the number of sampling locations. In 2015, the latest edition of the standard, a lookup table was introduced for determining the number of sample locations. Prior to this, in the previous editions of the standard, the number of locations was based on the square root of the area of the clean room or clean zone being considered. The sample locations should be deployed in a vertical plane for horizontal unidirectional airflow. And we don't talk about laminar flow, it's unidirectional airflow. And a horizontal plane for vertical unidirectional airflow. And here is the lookup table. And just to give you an idea of how this has changed, if we just scan down to a hundred square meters, say I had a hundred square meters of clean zone, the nearest here is the next largest is 104 square meters and that would require 16 sample locations as a minimum. I can add more if I feel it's appropriate for some reason on the shape and size of my clean room. More about that later when I show an example. If you reflected back prior to 2015, you would find that the equivalent 100 square meters square root would have given you 10 locations. So in the transition from the previous version to the 2015 version, we have more sample locations required. 
And the reason this has happened was because there was a review of the statistical basis of the classification system, and it was decided to try and have more consistency. And these number of sample locations are based on a 95% confidence that at least 90% of the zone will comply with the class. Now, if you wanted higher confidence or 95% of the zone complying, you would have to choose more locations. Okay, but this is stating the basis of this standard, which was based on a level of confidence that was deemed to be compatible and appropriate to industry practice and requirements. You can always choose more locations if you wish. The next consideration in the standard is the sample size calculation. So at each location, and the first phrase here is really important, at each location, as determined from the table, the sample volume should be sufficient that you would detect a minimum of 20 particles for the largest selected particle size if you were at the class limit for that class. Okay, then you need to think about those words quite carefully. And the little simple algorithm is that the sample size in liters of air is 20 divided by the class limit times a thousand to do the units conversion. And that would give you the sample size required in liters. There's also a requirement that you have a minimum sample of two liters and a minimum sample time of one minute. And it may be that this minimum volume or this minimum sample time actually dictates the sample size you collect. So if I had a particle counter that samples at 28.3 liters a minute, which is one cubic foot per minute in old money, and my evaluation required a one minute sample, then my sample size would be 28.3 liters. If I happen to be using a particle counter that sampled at 40 liters a minute and the one minute rule applied, then my sample size would be 40 liters. The sample volume at each location must be the same, but then there is an additional mechanism which is included in a separate informative annex called sequential sampling, which can be used if you have very, very large samples required and large sampling times. And sequential sampling, I'm not going to deal with it in any detail today, but is a mechanism where you look at the rate of count acquisition and you use this to predict if you are likely to easily comply with the class that you're looking for or if you are most likely to exceed that class limit by looking at the count rate and this allows you to either shorten your sampling or abandon the test if it looks as though you're going to fail. So be aware there is a mechanism to help you deal with very large sample sizes and times. I'll show some examples of how this sample size calculation pans out in reality in a moment. Then the final key element of the standard is the class evaluation. All locations must comply with the class limit. Okay, so each individual location from the multiple numbers that you have chosen must comply with the class limits. If I have multiple counts at each location, I can average the counts at each location, but I cannot, I cannot 
average across locations. The old 95% upper confidence limit evaluation that was in the 1999 version of the standard has been removed. And the justification for this is that for certain areas of clean zone, you now need larger number of locations to give the confidence. And there is special guidance for dealing with some of the specific requirements in the European Union GMP Annex 1, looking at grade A and grade B particle threshold size of five micron requirements. <clears throat> so this is what I call the five micron problem or the five micron challenge. So be aware that there's some specific guidance related to that. Now, of course, this may all change with the long awaited revision of Annex 1. But currently the 2008 version of Annex 1 applies and therefore this guidance in 14644 part one 2015 is still directly applicable. Now, just a quick reflection on pharmaceutical industry GMPs. So they define a whole number of environmental control requirements. So we have environmental cleanliness and airborne particles are one part of that. And the other is microbiological cleanliness or microbiological contamination. And that considers airborne and surfaces. The GMP also has other things about room pressure differentials, air change rates implied by recovery time or ventilation effectiveness, unidirectional airflow velocities, and some limited guidance on final filter requirements. So our clean room standard, BSEN ISO 14644 part one, 2015, just focuses on the concentration, number concentration of airborne particles as measured using an airborne particle counter. But just remember that the ISO standard specifically relates to a part of a broader range of environmental control requirements. So if we look at the table in Annex 1, and I've simplified it a little bit, it includes at rest and in operation requirements. It requires that we consider two threshold particle sizes, right? so equal to and greater than these thresholds. It also has some microbiological requirements, which we're not going to consider today. And then in here, it has threshold particle concentration limits for the different particle sizes. Now, everywhere except where I have highlighted in yellow, these numbers align with the ISO 14644 Part 1, 2015, cleanliness classes. So if we just follow grade A, 3,520 particles, 0.5 micron, equal to and greater than 0.5 micron, is the same value that appears in the clean room standard. But where I've highlighted the yellow, the 220s and the 29, if you remember from my earlier table on the clean room standard, it is blank. And it says you should not use this particle threshold size, so equal to or greater than, point, other than 5 micron, to classify cleanliness in this level of cleanliness zone, ISO 5. Okay, so this relates to ISO 5, and on in the ISO clean room standard, that box is blank. We have three areas where there is a gap or a problem, supposedly, potentially, between the 
GMP requirement and the ISO standard. These 220s and the 29 are not included in ISO class 5 in the clean room standard and we must use an adaptation of the macro particle descriptor to assess the concentration of the particles equal to and greater than five microns. So if we look at this another way, dealing with the Annex 1 limits in ISO 5. So remember, I called these standards a toolbox for classification. So in this case, the GMP sets the levels and requirements and the ISO clean room standard gives me the tools for doing the classification. And Annex C7 specifically describes adaptation of the macro particle descriptor to accommodate consideration of equal to and greater than five micron particles for ISO class five clean rooms. So what it tells us is that we can use the macro particle descriptor and its designation to define the 29 and 20 particle limit requirements in the GMP. So it gives us a way of doing this, but it cannot ever be strictly an ISO class, it's an indicative measurement using the macro particle descriptor. A bit complicated, but I hope that makes sense. So let's look at the impact of this on sample size calculation, because the sample size calculation applies to both the classes in table one and to the macro particle descriptor. We always base the sample size requirement on the largest considered particle size, because that will always dictate the, the maximum air volume required. For grade A at rest and in operation, the 20 particles per cubic meter limit applies of macro particles. And if you apply this little algorithm, you will find that 20 over 20 times 1,000 gives you 1,000 litres or a cubic metre. And for grade B, the 29 particle limit applies and you apply that to this formula here and you end up with a volume requirement at each location of 693 litres. So that would be your basis for volume calculation based on the macro particles in Annex 1. Now, when we move on to grade B in operation, now suddenly the number of particles at the class limit increases. It sits in the ISO clean room standard class table, and we would need to take a minimum one minute sample. We could take more if we wanted to, but a minimum sample size of one minute would apply. And for grade C and D, a one minute sample would apply there if we apply the ISO clean room standard rules. So you can see there's a big impact on sample size of these GMP limits. But let's have a look at a practical application of designing a sampling plan, number of sampling locations for a, an industrial situation. So I've taken a life science application, we could apply exactly the thing, same requirement to a semiconductor application. Um, so here's an industrial aseptic filling operation, washing, depyrogenation, and aseptic filling operation grade A clean zones in a grade B room. And note the configuration of the equipment and then feeding forward into a grade D space for final um, securing of the filled containers. I want to focus briefly on the filling and stoppering room here. 
which is a grade B space according to the GMP and has grade A clean zone over the critical operations. This represents what happens in the real world. Very rarely do we find a nice, clean, rectangular, empty box. There are normally some obstructions, equipment, um, clean air zones within a general clean room space. So we need to understand how that space is organized and apply the standard in a practical way. So let's look at a simple plan. So I've slightly simplified it for the purpose of this presentation and discussion. But here you have the filling machine, and here you have the transfer, the protection of the filled containers so they pass out of the filling room into the capping and inspection. And here is a grade A unidirectional airflow zone for receiving goods coming out of the autoclave. And this is the surrounding grade B space. So first of all, I need to look at this and decide how I'm going to divide up this space. So I look at this and I use my experience. And there are a number of important things I have to consider. The size of the room and the size of the zones. So this blue space, am I going to consider that as a single area or effectively is it subdivided by the machinery in the room? So I look at this and I say, well, actually, there, whilst there is a communication across the top of this equipment here, the room is in a way divided into two main parts. Plus, these clean zones are separately identified clean zones. So I have blue grade B space, and I have two main areas of that. And then I have three zones of grade A unidirectional airflow space. So I go through and I evaluate the requirements. So I divide the clean room into logical zones. First of all, by ISO class or GMP grade, then by areas or regions of operation. And the only other thing I need to consider is that the GM, the, the ISO clean room standard very specifically says, do not locate a sampling location directly under a HEPA filter supply if it is undiffused. So here, going back to my room, I have a diffuser on my HEPA filter supply. So this rule wouldn't apply. So I could place a sample location directly under this because the air is mixed by the diffusing device. I don't have a clean column of air which could distort the um, particle count by being a super clean zone. So there are some rules within the sampling guidance in the ISO standard. So the grade B areas, <clears throat> um, so I've got um, eight meters by one meter, eight square meters. And if I apply the table, I would require four locations for this area. And then if I take the balance of this blue area, um, that is 19.37 square meters, and that would require six locations. But I then look at it and I see, actually, I've got this little corner and the standard does not tell you specifically how to deal with odd shapes. So I would almost certainly take a view here. I would do six locations equally distributed into this area and add an additional location down here. Others may do it slightly differently, and that would be quite acceptable but you need some practical application of the standard. It does not tell you how to do funny shapes, and it doesn't, for example, tell you how to deal with a very tall clean room. So if I was assembling a space rocket, I might, to, might need to designate two or three 
levels to do my classification in a very tall room. So just bear in mind that the standard tries to deal with a relatively straightforward situation. I then look at the grade A zones. And in here, the standard would tell me I need three locations, here three locations, and here two locations. So that would be the minimum number of locations. It may be when I look at the equipment configured under this grade A zone here or here, that I decide I want to do more locations related to specific risks associated with the process. And the standard gives me freedom to do that. So the standard gives you a framework for evaluating the minimum number of locations, but you need to apply this in a practical way. I've talked about the essence of the clean room classification in BSE and ISO 14644 part one, 2015. So it tells us about classification by particle number concentration. It gives us various rules about defining the class, correct terminology and designation, sample size calculation, number of sample locations, and how to evaluate the data, plus some other supplementary guidance about dealing with the five micron issue in Annex 1. Having got that under our belts, we need to understand a little more about Part 2, so ISO 14644 Part 2, 2015, and what that says to us. So this is to do with operational monitoring. And this is the front page of the British Standard Version. And it begins by saying clean room and clean air devices should be routinely monitored in operation and the monitoring locations based on a formal risk analysis study and results obtained during classification. So that would be a clear expectation of a principle of ongoing monitoring. The standard provides what I would call a risk-based guidance for developing and implementing a monitoring system. It provides some minimum requirements, but be aware if you're in a regulated industry, the GMPs are much more specific and include levels and values. It provides guidance on real-time monitoring, so particularly real-time particle counting, room pressure monitoring, for example, and periodic tests undertaken from time to time to confirm that the um, clean room or clean air device is working satisfactorily to provide evidence. Now, here we have a very important table in the standard, and this is included in the UK British Standard version only. And this is a national annex that provides informative, it's not a requirement, informative, recommended guidance and a schedule for testing clean rooms and clean zones. So first of all, it describes airborne particle concentration. So what we would typically call particle counting. So in zones that are equal to or cleaner than ISO 5, the guidance is six months. And for zones which are less clean than ISO 5, 12 monthly intervals. But then there's a note related to this that points out that when frequent or continuous monitoring systems are provided, it then says that any of these guidance intervals may be extended, can be extended. And it doesn't give a boundary for that extension. Pressure differentials continuously monitored by frequent manual observation <clears throat> or by automatic, automated instrumentation. Installed filter leak test, six months for ISO 5 and cleaner, 12 months for less clean. Airflow velocities, six and 12 months. And then it goes through some of the um, 
other support tests, so containment leak test, airflow visualization, we sometimes call these smoke patterns, recovery time in non-unidirectional airflow, particle deposition rates, segregation tests, temperature, humidity, electrostatic evaluation. So most of these, it says at commissioning and thereafter every four years or after any significant change to the airflow system or equipment content of the clean room or clean air device. So this guidance is included only in the UK version. And why did that happen? It happened because um, UK experts and UK industry felt that some outline informative guidance was important and it was missing from the EN ISO version. There should also be with the standard says a written rationale for your monitoring program. So you should always be able to go back to some written basis for your monitoring program. Real time particle monitoring. So this shows a particle monitoring location, a fixed location inside a filling isolator device in this particular case. The standard does not mandate where you place these. There is some guidance about placing this kind of device in part two. Part two also talks about setting alert and action levels and Annex B deals with this specifically. And it says you must establish your normal operating range. If it's a brand new installation, this will take some time to refine because you will need to collect some evidence to reach a conclusion about what your normal operating range is. You should then establish alerts which give you a warning of a drift before an action level is breached. So something, so you've got time to do something about it. So the standard does not actually guide you to specific values. It describes the principles that you need to adopt. Clearly instrument calibration is an essential part of any monitoring program. And it also points out that you should have considered the impact of equipment and facility operations. And you may need to set delays on alarms to tolerate the normal short-term transients that can occur. The standard in part two says you should always review data to look for trends. So you're not just waiting to cross a crisis threshold, you're looking to sense that the performance of the space is moving um, and you require to act before you reach a critical alarm action level. It also points out that you should have a predefined clear response plan for alerts and actions. So when they do occur, you follow something that's been thought through in advance. So my final thoughts and conclusions. So ISO 14644 parts one and two 2015 deal with classification of air cleanliness and monitoring of the clean room and clean air device environments. They are the core clean room standards. It's what differentiates a clean room from other controlled space. So this classification and managing of air cleanliness is what differentiates and why we call it a clean room. Remember the standards are generic. They are not application specific and we therefore have to mesh them in with regulatory or other user requirements. Make sure you use the correct nomenclature and terminology and don't be sloppy with incorrect reference to classes or the standards themselves. Understand how to apply the standards correctly in the real world. So you will need some adaptation, funny shaped rooms, 
equipment interaction in clean room and clean air device space will require some sensible application of a standard that is written in a fairly simplified way. In the life science sector, I've already said this, ensure you understand the link between regulations, the GMPs, and the standards, because the standards are generic. But they work together. The GMPs define the cleanliness requirements, and the clean room standards I've been talking about specify how to classify that space and aspects of monitoring to collect evidence of performance. Ensure that there is a clear plan from moving to, from classification to operational monitoring. And of course, that classification is likely to be undertaken at the same time or at the end of a commissioning exercise. And keep a lookout for revision to the standards. They are always going through a systematic revision process. And it may well be that the standard um, gets updated. So right now, ISO Technical Committee 209 is in the final parts of the deliberation over the revision of ISO 14644 Part 4, Design and Construction and Startup of Clean Rooms. And at some point in the next three months, four months, that will come out for public comment. And probably within 12 months, it'll be published as a revised standard with updated requirements. So be aware of standards developing and evolving. And CCN will keep you up to date about the standards and their development. Thank you very much for your attention.